All right, welcome integrated math superstars. You made it to 1.5. We're going to take a look at some of the problems that are featured on the Ready, Set, Go for 1.5. I hope you're having an awesome day. What are the topics for these first set of problems? Dealing with rates of change in a table or a graph and common difference. Ooh, I've heard that word before. And making a note that the common difference is also known as the rate of change and also what some people refer to as slope, where you might have also heard of this as rise over run. And there's an equation that goes with it too. And maybe we'll dive into that, we'll see. So what's this first problem set asking us? The same sequence is shown in both the table seen here and a graph seen here, easy enough. On the sides of the table, write numbers to show the rate of change, the common difference. In addition to that on the graph, connect two adjacent points with vertical and horizontal lines to show the rate of change. All right, so the first one's dealing with our table, trying to find our common difference, which we've seen before. So we're always trying to map out our difference from point to point, from f of n point to the next f of n point or the previous f of n point. And so we'll do that for all of these. Starting first with n, what's that jump from one to two? What's that common difference? Hopefully you're saying that it's just adding one. And that seems to be the case here from two to three and from four to five. Simple enough, right? Sorry, from one to two, two to three, three to four, and four to five, yeah. And then what about for the change, rate of change for f of n? What's that common difference? Hopefully you're saying plus three. And that's consistent the whole way through. We can then talk about our rate of change where we have our change in f of n. So we have the, what I'll call triangle f of n, sometimes they call this change in f of n. So think of this as the change in f of n over the change in n. So we see that no matter which point we focus on, we're always gonna have three over one. And can we simplify that further? Hopefully you're saying yes, three over one. Since both terms are positive, you can just rewrite that as positive three. So this is considered our rate of change. So that's done for part A. And then for B, we're taking a look at the table. So we're trying to map out from these points how we can use the vertical and the horizontal lines to show that this rate of change is developing. So we'll start at this point, which appears to be one, two. And we'll map up that change going up to the next point, which should be two, five. Okay. So I know that if I was going from this point to this point, I could use that straight line. But remember, we're using vertical and horizontal lines. So we would go up one, two, three units. And then we would go over one unit, which is definitely giving light to our rate of change, which was going up three in the f of n direction, and then going over one in the n direction. And this is pretty consistent throughout, where we're always going up three over one, up three over one, up three over one. Hopefully you see that consistency. Same okay, right? Uh, those are the same kind of deal. We'll jump to the set where we're now working with geometric sequences, which recall aren't just adding four, adding four, adding four. You know, sometimes it's going to be multiplying the previous by two and getting us the current. Sometimes we have exponents involved here. Think about our decimal activity for this. 
In this situation, we're being given various types of information, write the recursive and explicit function for each geometric sequence. So I see here that we have a jump from two to four. So this is just adding two. But then we're adding from four to eight, which is plus four. And then from eight to 16, which is plus eight. Okay, seems fine, right? But notice we're no longer just adding the same number over and over. We have to be a little bit more strategic here. So recall that our recursive is always asking us to find our first term or the beginning term. So that's something you should always ask yourself whenever you're dealing a recursive form of the function is what was the very first term that was given or the beginning term that was given. So in this case, our first term is two. So we would say that f of one equals two. And then what pattern do you see with these numbers as they move towards the right? Hopefully you're saying that it's the previous number multiplied by two. So recall that we are creating our function f of n and in words it might be nice to piece this out so we're saying that our current is equal to the previous times two hopefully you see that change so our first term was definitely two so we can say f of one equals two because we're talking about our first term and then mapping out this using f of n we have our current as f of n. And that should be equal to the previous term, which in this case is, what do you think? What's before n? Hopefully you're saying n minus one. And then that multiplies with two. So our recursive states these two things, that f of one is two, and that f of n is equal to f of n minus one times two. Makes sense, right? Okay. For the explicit, this is gonna help us find our value, our output, no matter what value or whatever term we're trying to hunt down. So if we wanted the 100th term, we got it. If we wanted the 1,000th term, we got it. Main difference here is that with recursive, we need the very first term or the beginning term, but with explicit, we can plug in any number and we can get our output. So hope that helps. One thing that I like to do whenever I'm working with these types of problems is to make a table. So I'm gonna call this N, graphed out against F of N. Our first term was two, our second term was four, our third term was eight, fourth term was 16. And so we already found the common difference. There wasn't much going on there. So what I like to do is break these apart as much as I can to see if there's a pattern that's gonna show up. So I know that this is just two times one. I know that this is two times two. I know that this is gonna be two times two times two, I know that 16, how many twos do you think are gonna multiply there? Hopefully you're saying four versions. And our goal is that hopefully as this continues, when we approach N, we'll most likely have a lot of versions of two but since we see this as using multiplication and it's a geometric sequence, chances are we're gonna have our exponent of n. So we would say that our function for the explicit is f of n equals 2n. Does that make sense? Seeing what I'm putting down? And so if we were graphing these out, uh, I'll call this bottom part here n, this will be our outcome of f of n. We go in increments of ones on the bottom. So 
one, two, three, four. As far as f of n, we see two, four, eight, sixteen. So I'm going to go in increments of twos, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen. So when our first term is n as one, the outcome's two. When n is two, the outcome's four. When n is three, the outcome is eight. So we're now at the fourth situation. And we see that this quickly starts to snowball us up to 16. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. All right. Yeah, right here. So we see that this behaves pretty wild, which is okay. You know, it's not just adding four every time. It's very different. And I'll do a quick go problem where we're doing the same thing, but now it's arithmetic. So in this case, having two, four, six, and eight, this is adding two every time. So notice just switching it up for arithmetic. It's okay. We've done this before, right? So in a way, this should just be a recap. So our first term, f of one, it's just going to be two. I know that this is increasing two every time. So our current term f of n is equal to the previous term f of n minus one, which is plus two. That makes sense, right? And then for our explicit, recall that this is where we have to find the very beginning. So having the first term here is okay, but with explicit, we're gonna have to go back the beginning. So prior to two, what's the previous number going to have to be? Hopefully you're saying zero. It might be nice to throw that in. So we would say that we're starting with zero. And then what's our common difference? Hopefully you're saying two, and this all depends on the n term. So zero plus two n's okay, but can we clean this up a little bit more? Hopefully you're saying yes. We can take this further, just clean it up to two n. If we graph this out, our beginning term is zero. I'll map this out using ones. I'll map this out using twos. And we know that we're starting at 0, 0, but then we go to 1, 2, then to 2, 4, then to 3, 6, then to 4, 8. Boom. Hope that was helpful. If you have any questions, let me know. Thanks for watching.